Welcome to the second day of responsible from technology from 24. Uh, unlike yesterday, I think we should start on time. Uh, so today, uh, well, very quick uh, announcements first. As you know, uh, tonight we have the conference dinner. Uh, the bear is on, on the agenda. If you don't have an agenda with you, uh, just let me know. I can share one with you. Um, and regarding the reimbursement sheets, if you need one, just find me during one of the breaks and get one from me. Uh, it would be best if you just fill these and give them back to me uh, before the event is over so that the process is completely. That being said, uh, today we have, again, a uh, very, uh, I think, uh, interesting and uh, important uh, sessions, panels. And uh, we will start with the art science interaction efforts in PT session, which I am the chair of. So what a coincidence. Uh, we will have three talks, uh, one by Adrian Schmidt, who is there, who is also a part of our team at ETAS. Uh, one by uh, Anna Yop, who, who is there, and she is part of the Goethe Institute's uh, wonderful Studio Quantum program. And one uh, by Roman Lutsky, who is there, uh, who is uh, a quantum artist and here to sell you his art, as he said yesterday. I'm joking. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, okay, so, and uh, let's begin. Edwin, can I get you uh, to the stage? And let me open your presentation. Cool. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me in the back like that? It's good. So yeah, I'm Adrian. I'm going to talk or I try to wake uh, you up all with arts and science um, in, in quantum tech. Um, my title of the talk is Artists in Quantum Tech, Their Works, Views, and How They Could Shape the Future of Quantum Technologies. Um, I'm not going to show you artworks by quantum artists. Um, I think that's more Romans and, and Anna's job in the, in the session. I'm going to try to tell you more about why is that important, maybe useful for our field and kind of what is going on in, in our group. Um, there's some arts in there, which is actually AI generated arts with prompts with quantum superposition, whatever. So not real quantum art and not even art, maybe if you if you follow maybe Roman's idea of, of, of doing art. Um, what I'm gonna tell you about today is, um, I would say you have on one side, you have the sciences. In, in art science, there's science and technology on one side. In there, there's maybe responsible research and innovation somehow, like in there. Mm. I would say everyone here in the group would say it should cover all of the science and technology, but it probably isn't. And there's also somewhere quantum technologies. Um, don't look at the scales. It's, it's just like there's some overlap. And um, I would say quantum tech is covered not badly by responsible research. I feel like this group here and, and other people doing a good job there. But yeah, so we have these three fields somehow. And on the other side, we have the arts. Some whatever blurry picture here um, and showing what art could be. And today I want to I want to do the following. I want to show you that there's some overlap between art and science. That there's some overlap between um, arts and also responsible research and innovation, but also between arts and um, quantum technologies. And um, these three overlaps I want to talk about, and especially the one in red, because that is what we do from ETAS, or I personally um, in this group here. Um, and that's that's going to be my presentation about. Um, why me? So I'm Adrian. Um, I worked, so I'm a physicist. Um, I'm a new member of the group uh, since November, so quite recently still. Um, I do a PhD here in, broadly said, technology assessment of quantum technologies. Um, I did laser medicine. I did some quantum dots, so more an experimental physicist. Worked on quantum computing and looked on different hardware platforms. So. Why am I doing arts now? Um, I'm not an artist, not at all. Um, but besides the science and besides this trying to, I don't know, understand a bit what the world is and um, maybe how does somehow function as far as we know, I think it's it's interesting also to see the more of the human perspective. So to give, I don't know, sense to all that and, and see what, what, what humans make out of it. 
And I, I just find that fascinating. And um, a few years back, I, I said, I want to have more art in my life. And I feel like that is some, some way of, of getting in there. So I, I personally really like that. But after talk, telling a bit about myself, I want to know a bit about you and wake you up maybe a bit. So who has ever thought about art-science interaction at all before yesterday? Because we talked yesterday about it. Okay, that's actually quite a lot. That's good. Okay, who thought about art-science interaction in quantum technologies yet? Kind of the same. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. And um, who has already experienced quantum art or quantum technology art? So who has seen any of that? Maybe that is the reason for the answers of the first two. Okay, okay, interesting. Good to know. So maybe my my talk is not not necessary here today, but like let's let's try my best. Um, so I want to start now with art and um, the intersection with science and technologies. And I would say, what is science doing? I mean, science and technology is somehow trying to describe the world as it is, or at least as it seems to be. I mean, whoever thought about fundamentals of quantum mechanics, um, interpretations of it, I don't know what reality is, all that, it gets a bit fuzzy more, but like that seems to be a task of science. We want to model that somehow, so find the kind of best known model about it. Um, we do experiments, try to um, find theories about it, so this kind of models, and then test the theory again. We have rigorous rules, somehow they need to be re uh, reproducible. And we have a more mathematical language, um, which is as abstract as possible somehow. And these kind of rules and all that all that knowledge is usually, usually used for building technology, especially when it comes to whatever quantum technologies or so. And then on the other side, when you look on the arts, I mean, it's human made and really like, like it, it happens in the, in the hearts of the humans. It's creative, no clear rules. So, I mean, there seem to be some rules, but they are not really clear in arts. Um, there's no clear language, there are different expression forms. It's not rigorous. And um, it somehow relies on beauty, on aesthetic perception. So somehow there, there seems to be a gap in between. Um, but I would say there's a big overlap between these two. Um, and I would say, Art can be useful for the following um, to solve problems in or um, through science and technologies. We know a lot about that. Um, we talked about it yesterday as well. I mean, there are things scientists or engineers cannot imagine yet. Um, there are problems we can't solve yet. There are um, ideas we don't have yet. And that's definitely something which is in science and in technology. There's impact on society. I mean, who, I need to tell that um, there is like impact from technology on society. And there's the question, what does society want in terms of um, technology development? Um, all that questions we are targeting and there's a lack of understanding of large group of people. So there's an education need definitely because a lot of people don't understand um, maybe what science is in general or how certain sciences are working or how technology is working. I mean, Peter yesterday said the quantum it's not the problem, actually, the digital technology is the problem. So there are a lot of educational questions, actually, we are facing. And I would say art and art science interaction can help solve some of these problems. And I don't want to give you a bullet point list first. I want to give you some examples which are already there. Um, there's on one side the balance. And I talked to some artists and actually um, that artist gave me that idea to look in there. I just briefly did. but. For example, the Bell Labs in the 60s and the 70s, and that's a lab, they developed transistors, they developed lasers, they, they worked on C++ or um, other programming language, so very high tech in the end. And they had artists in the 60s and 70s for a very long time. And I mean, known artists as Andy Warhol or others worked actually with the engineers and with the scientists there. And um, they, I forgot actually what that acronym um, was called, but it's somehow experiments, arts and technology. Um, some argue these artists in cooperation with the engineers made the bellops very um, functioning in terms of creating visions, creating ideas and developing the technology further. But what is, what is clear is that these artists actually were able to use the technology to, to push a bit the, uh, the technology out of the labs 
into society. So that, that definitely helped in terms of outreach perspectives. Um, there is, besides the Bell Labs nowadays, actually the Art Center, um, oh no, the Center for Art, Science and Technology at MIT. I mean, everyone knows MIT. And if they do it, it seems to be something. Um, they do it for very long. Um, they do residencies, for example, with artists. They include artists in their research projects. They do classes for, um, for scientists to work with artists or on arts or be creative. Um, they have funding lines for that. So they, they do several things. And that's actually just a screenshot from their website. So you can, you can go in there. Um, but they, they have a very, very big focus actually on art science. Um, but we don't need to just look um, in the States. There's also uh, stuff in Germany and especially in Karlsruhe. So that's the uh, Zentrum für Kunst und Medium, so Center for Arts and Science in Karlsruhe. And I just put like from the website um, their, their statements. So one of the fundamental tasks of ZKM is to identify and follow current developments in art and society. So they yeah try to be up to date in, in these terms. And especially the Hertz Lab, um, led by Tina Lorenz, um, a collaborator of us, they work on transdisciplinary research and development platform at the interface of media, arts, science, and society. So they want to find out what is going on in, in science and um, how that could affect actually society in a certain sense. They, they think creative about it. And um, Tina can definitely tell more about, but they have clearly this like science, arts, and society intersection um, as one of their focus. So in Karlsruhe, people working on that. And to stay in Karlsruhe, also KIT and also ITAS did things on that. So this is just two, um, two posters from, um, from things that happened last year and the year before. So that's more on theaters. It's the Congress that, um, der Zukunfte in Berlin. I actually attended it and saw what, what Christopher and the people there did. So it was more on, um, it's more an outreach um, effort, but um, an idea is also to develop methods further. So methods of TA, technology assessment, um, to develop them further. And here always um, under hermeneutic TA, I mean, um, um, yesterday we heard briefly about it. I, I don't go into detail there, but like there's things going on in our group. And to give you one more, um, Biofaction is an organization in, in Vienna. They do art science interaction and we co cooperate with them on some slime mold experiments in quantum. Ziki can maybe tell more about, I, I'm not so deeply in there actually. Um, but it's it's interesting to see what, what is possible, actually. All right. So after we, we talked about that, I would say all these three examples give you some ideas that maybe vision creation can be possible through art science. Just think about Bell Labs, that some co-creation is possible. Um, think about um, the theaters or what is ZKM, for example, doing and education and outreach. I mean, that is pretty, pretty clear that outreach is possible through arts because it reaches different groups. And I would argue that these are elements of responsible research and innovation. It's not the same, I'm, I'm, I know, but like there are elements in there. So I'd argue we covered that as well. And now let's get to the last part and back to this slide. So about what is happening in quantum. And when you think about these problems here in science and technology, I would say this is all also in quantum tech. So there are things engineers and scientists can't imagine yet. I mean, there are open questions, obviously, in, in, in quantum technologies and also in quantum fundamentals. There's an impact on society. That's what we talk about here. And there's a lack of understanding of certain people because it's somehow fuzzy, maybe this quantum. So it definitely, um, this, this, this field um, is there. So I want to show you now what we do in there um, and what we did recently. Um, we or I recently started an interview study um, um, with artists working on, in and with quantum technology. So I want to find out what is the arts this um, artists are doing? What are the reasons for the artists to work on it? What is their learning journey and what are their visions? Because I think that's all very interesting because besides seeing very nice art, um, this motivation and especially the learning journey is very interesting for people which are right now outside of quantum technologies. Because um, like what artists maybe experience in their, in their learning of quantum technologies could be applic applicable maybe for other people of society. 
And um, therefore I did or started an interview study. Um, right now, um, I can just give you anecdotal evidence because it's not published yet. Um, I just, for now, interviewed six artists. We aim for 20, snowball sampling and uh, purpose sampling. But I can tell you, quite diverse already in terms of geographical um, background, in terms of gender, ETC, um, very different artists. And they have diverse backgrounds. Um, so some are physicists, or no, physicists we don't, but some are computer scientists, some are trained artists. And um, the quantum tech art um, experience is going to be shown maybe by Bowman or by Anna. So I'm, I'm not going to go in there, but there are musicians in there. They are visual artists. Um, and there are different kinds of artists in that study. But what I find very interesting already, and that's going to, I'm going to show you now, because we can maybe discuss it a bit, um, the motivations. I just clicked through here because everyone is somewhat interested in physics somehow, but on different layers. Um, two people told me about that there are philosophical questions um, concerning interpretations of it. So there seems to be like, like some, some interest by the artists in that field. One told me he wants to be the one of the first in this kind of evolving field. So they see a growing field in terms of, of quantum art. And the, these two, I mean, that's what I mentioned. Mostly everyone thinks about outreach. So it has an outreach perspective. And some say they want to have a social impact by opening up the discourse. So they want to ask questions to society through their art. And um, yeah, ask the society, okay, what do you want? Because like that's there, that's happening. And to, to get um, some interest in there. And after a lot of other things, everyone said it's just fun. And it's for me very inspiring actually to talk to the artists because you, you just end up after an interview like, okay, these people really love what they do. So I, I can tell you that's, that's great. Um, about audience and feedback, um, most of them don't really have an audience in mind, which I find interesting. So they don't want to reach... Um, specific people, but the audience so far is mostly from the tech side and mostly from other artists side. So general public is pretty often not covered yet. And on the feedback, that's also a very interesting quote. I heard twice um, that the people which go to exhibitions or follow their art say, okay, how do you do it? Is that really quantum or so? So they talk actually about um, their tools. They talk about their instruments or their brushes or so, and not about their arts. And some artists are very um, not sat satisfied about that. So I, I just found that a very interesting quote. Um, so after motivations, briefly about the learnings, because um, I, I think I just have one minute left. Um, so there are diverse backgrounds in there. There are people with no scientific background. Um, therefore, they had a longer route, but some really um, were already scientists and and. Um, dig very deeply in there. So they are from reading a bit of popular science articles to reading books, talking to scientists. Talking to scientists is definitely something everyone wishes. So um, who wants to talk to artists, they are very open for that. I mean, just so I'm maybe going to tell you. Um, they all love to, to talk about that. And um, rate of knowledge, I asked everyone, how would they rate their knowledge on a scale from one to five? I got three times the answer, 0 0.8. I don't know why, but like it's, 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 it happened really three times. Um, it's, it's odd. Um, so they, they would rate their, their knowledge a bit more on the lower side. Um, and there's clearly a different access to quantum technologies. So most of them asked for more contact to scientists, more contact to, um, to the technology itself and play around with it to develop further things. And um, about the vision and future developments, I already told you a bit about it. Um, everyone said it's a growing field. More people are entering, entering it, um, that there is a need for, for arts and science in there, um, but also need for more collaboration, more contact, as I just said. And um, in general, I mean, we as a group, we, we want to finish this interview study. Um, we want to finish the, the, the sampling and the publication, and then we'll see where to go from there. But I find that that fascinating. I think there's a lot possible. So to conclude, I hope I showed you that there's some overlap and that the overlap in the middle is very interesting. So arts, science, and quantum technologies together. Um, it, I think it can help to solve um, RRI-related problems. Um, the artists vary widely in their motivation, experience, and artworks, although all want to work more in it and want to collaborate with us or other scientists. 
and that we are, as ETAS from KIT, want to focus more on it together with Goethe, which is Anna telling you in a second, with ZKM, and, but also maybe with others, see where to go from there. So thank you all. Okay, we can accept two quick questions. Uh, one from Mira, and uh, I think the next one was Oksana. That... Yeah. I think it's really appreciation of the kind of structure question as to the relationship. Um, and it's in particular the relationship that I'm interested in. I currently and that might be because we're dealing with a physics heavy topic here and physics typically thinks, you know, physics understands the universe and typically I mean, physics understand everything anyway. Regarding the power, power relationship between arts and science. So I somewhat, when asking these questions, I was starting to be worried that we're having kind of art at the service of science. So we're using kind of this, this the risk of using art to help us explain science better because we're not good at doing that with other tools. And wonder whether you, how you see that, do you see that problematic and or should, and also whether we should, there's a way to kind of, if we're seeing that, uh, to reverse it. So shouldn't science be at the service of art? And kind of, so I'm, I'm curious about the power relationship. Yeah, I see the problem and I mean, that is, it's about okay. Is are we just doing outreach by arts? I mean, that's that's basically what what maybe you said. What what the problem could be? And I wouldn't say that's that shouldn't that shouldn't be the goal. Um, I would say it is an aspect, as we heard yesterday briefly. Also, that it can be useful for for showing what we are doing. But I would say there are more to it, and um, it's more about like the artists themselves have ideas we maybe don't have. So it's more together with them to see where to go with it, and. There's different language in there, so it's very hard, I would say, but I would love to have the power equal in that in that sense to see can we learn also something from there and, and yeah, by that. I, I see the problem yesterday, I think we talked about it, so when you talk to artists and they say they use no superposition and you as a physicist say oh, that's not really superposition, I see some problems in there in terms of which language to use and things like that, but um, in general, I would hope to have the power quite quite equal. Yeah. Is that answering the question? Thanks a lot for the presentation. Amazing, amazing, amazing start of the day. <laughs> uh, towards the RRI and the outreach. So yeah. here is the problem I face currently very much. So I work in Trieste and there's a city in Italy which has the biggest concentration of science and research. And it's so big that uh, the researchers between them have hard time to communicate, especially when they organize things for public. It's like uh, things are popping up like mushrooms and they are trying. They have made several systems to talk to, to like platforms to use to go. But it's just a difficult problem. So I don't know how to study. I need to study it. So this will be not for you now. So do you think that this art component, which to me is like a connection between research and the rest, can also help to connect between research and also between key stakeholders like policymakers and stuff. Because beauty is something that we all love to see. And this is something that we all react very well to. And uh, you know how to make it look like <laughs> we like to look at it. So my question is, should we also end this line very importantly for us, for artists, for you and for all, that it's not only outreach to public, but it's also outreach to key stakeholders. It's like between us outreach. So let's reach each other out and talk through the arts. So I think this would be an amazing. That's, that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, I feel like Anna can maybe like offer itself a bit about it. It's like also, also covered maybe in their, in their ideas. Um, I would say, it can be, but not structured. Um, so it's maybe about bringing the people together under this under this art. So I don't know when there's some in Berlin, there were some events by Goethe, for example, CDM festival. So there's some quantum music, and they presented there, and there are different folks coming, and they try to well, they talk to each other about it, about the arts, about the science behind it. So that's kind of a 
combining thing, but I don't see a clear structure in there. So it works like that. I, I don't know. I would more say it's about a fuzzy getting the people together. Okay. But I'm not, I don't know. I'm also new there. So we'll see where we are next year. Okay. Have like um, a research or like when you have like a, a talk or something like for the stakeholders, like a huge variety, create like vision assessment and create different visions and to understand and not just putting the art out there but also taking the art and coming into discussion with the people and different stakeholders and what kinds of um results or what kind of expectations are within this and where are gaps so that can be found out. So um, art can be like an addition, but it's not really a standalone thing when it comes to RI and when it comes to um, quantum as well. But yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. Okay, that being said, let's thank Henry. Thank you. And our next next speaker is an actual quantum artist. So prepare your questions. <laughs> but I'm going for a <laughs> uh, And the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> now, uh, I will share with you my personal story. It's a little bit different than uh, like yours because uh, I'm. This is what I uh, um, what I share, what I uh, try to explain how uh, Im the importance of uh, of uh, to be interdisciplinary, to mix science, for example, with with art, to mix completely different way to thinking about solving uh, as finding solutions and solving the problems. We actually, as artists, didn't do it, but. But there are scientists, they, they do investigate, investigations. And so I, this is the first, uh, first um, um, at the beginning, I will start it with, with this title. And I will ask you if, you will, if you're interested on the technology behind Quantum Blur about the picture I will share with you, then just check it out on internet. This is open source scientific documents published by, by uh, James Walton and myself, Abhauder. Uh, my partners in crime, we uh, are a kind of team and we develop the quantum art and uh, the, every technical details you will get uh, reading the, uh, the, the paper, but also, also Mira is here. Mira also helped me, uh, uh, was, or uh, is still a part of, of the, of the, of the team and somehow uh, supported me very much in, in long discussions about uh, how uh, important it is, and for, for, especially for scientists, but uh, not for artists, for scientists, uh, to, to, uh, to develop some, some new impulses from the artistic sides. And so in order not only to, to be, uh, to create some kind of illustrations to you, to your processes and to your to your work, because yeah, I see it. This is a very complicated situation for us, for artists, for example, because really there are a lot programs where artists are invited to to be a part of scientific projects, but but this is not enough. I so I I'm, I I missed uh, artistic projects or. Or, or artists, they invited uh, um, they invited scientists in the studio to uh, in order to create art. What about this? That you visited me in my studio and started to tufting carpets or painting pictures. In you, okay, yeah, I know. <laughs> and so I don't know. I'm a painter, and the my. For many years, I was just an only uh, um, analog artist. I painted with the brushes, and canvas, and, and created and told my stories, and was fascinated to share the story with with, with, with audience, with with art, with, uh, with, uh, with public. And 
somehow I get a, a kind of cre- a creative crisis because uh, the, the story, the, the stories I, I, I shared was was told, and there I needed something new, something a, a next step to to uh, so uh, leaving my uh, my my routine and and try to find uh, a new way to express myself, and I uh, I failed. I couldn't really for years. I stopped in the crisis. I couldn't. Uh, did the next step in the painting world. I wished to st- uh, stop to be a, a realistic painter and started to be, a, for example, an abstract painter. And they couldn't. But fortunately, I find a data scientist. And this is the beginning of the story where I implement uh, science or uh, technology uh, uh, in, in my art. And we develop a kind, together we started experiment with AI and I developed a kind of uh, method how to use AI in a very proper way, in a very, uh, very creative way. And I call it AI Muse at the past. Yeah? And the AI Muse was also a key, uh, also allowed me uh, to, to invite it to really people, they never painted, they, they, they told they was, they're not creative in my studio. And, and, and using the AI, developed their own creativity, they started paint with me, they started to be creative, they started to be the interaction and the interdisciplinary. Uh, I have it, uh, I really, I have the um, experience that uh, that everyone could be with the help of technology, could start to develop a completely new skills. And this is what I hope uh, using uh, quantum uh, technology, the, the, the story, the beautiful story of, of to, to awake the, the, the creativity or, or the different point of view, by by different people uh, will will be will work the same way and uh, at the beginning is always the human and the human activity and I as a painter in order to preparing something I started a, started a process create a kind of I need a an um, starting idea and uh, in the studio painter usually started to to draw something on the canvas. And then the next step is to paint. And this is how it's in the classical, how does it work in studio in the classical way? I paint a picture. And uh, why quantum? Why quantum blood and quantum technology? Based on the, on the story and the, I, uh, of, of the um, AI Muse, I got invitation to visit the um, the, um, the research uh, research IBM research in Zurich, and my first idea, and I was very impressed and, and very uh, happy about the possibility to see first li- first time in my, in my life uh, a quantum computer, and this was uh, the one and only wish to to see the hardware to to touch the to touch the the computer or to have. To hold in the hand the, the processor, yeah, it was amazing. I was I have no idea about quantum physics, uh, a little bit from from the press maybe. Yeah. And then after I saw the quantum computer and the cooling system, whatever, I fall in love with yeah. in the shape of of quantum computer first time. And then talking with uh, Walter Ries, with James, uh, with uh, with James at the time, and we got an idea to create something to mix. AI Muse, and James asked me, what about to mix AI Muse and, for example, a teleportation? And he flashed me. This was absolutely amazing story. I, I fall, and at the, at the one day I fall in love two times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I fall in love with the idea to use teleportation without knowing about this. I absolutely, immediately I have the picture of, uh, 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 of uh, Star Trek. And uh, based on the experience with AI, uh, because I started to, uh, I developed a kind of um, communication with the system because the data I created was based on my own work. And so also the outputs was, was very coherent with my own work. So I was in the, in, the, in the loop with the machine in a kind of dialogue. And they told the same idea will be, uh, will be, will be maybe work with, uh, with quantum blur. And uh, and I started to uh, feed feeding the, machine, the 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 software with my yeah, this is always the same story 
to present digital art on screens like this is, is didn't work. Yeah, I'm very really really sorry for this. Because it's too much fun. But maybe, yeah. Uh, but you have, believe me, that the that the the, the the power and the most beautiful things happen somehow as always in the art in between. And so the details are very important. You can see it now. But this is even cool that you you can not really enjoy the, the quantum art here in this as as a projection because uh, yeah I will, um, there are new uh, developments and so I started to I started the same the same process to to uh, to play with uh, with quantum blur because uh, as always I ask Jim thank you for for the idea of talking about quantum with, without uh, without uh, uh, without. Uh, to uh, speaking about the the engine behind about the technology because it's the, this is absolutely a horrible part of the presentation <laughs> uh, and and here you can you can see the picture and uh, the digital ones uh, James told me when I asked him uh, James what is quantum what is what is quantum computer how quantum computer is working and James told me you know, always the same story. There's an input, there's computing power in between, and there's an output. And this is everything you have to know. And, mm -hmm. it, and I, I really love this answer because it's helped me to, to, to clear my mind and to not borrow my, my, uh, my head with, with details. Yeah? And so I started using quantum blur. And you have believed me that everything you see here, this is, I used uh, teleportation, uh, um, interference effects, and uh, and, and then tangle one. Everything is here in those pictures I, I presented. You have to believe me. If not, then yeah. But I started, as I said, to be in a dialogue with, uh, with the quantum pictures. And this, those beautiful shapes and pictures are created with quantum blur. This is a quantum art. This is not about quantum. The pictures are not about quantum. This is the quantum mechanic covered with colors and, and, and shapes. And it's in my art. It was a kind of uh, beautiful situation and possibility to not only express myself but also to develop completely new ideas. And I started to use the quantum blur as uh, as a kind of digital painting canvas, in opposite to AI. A by AI, all, almost the results, the outputs, are happened randomly. I got beautiful uh, and, and uh, countless uh, uh, output picture, digital uh, variation of my own work, but always everything will happen by, uh, by, uh, by accident. Something, not accident, but, but randomly. And so it's also fantastic, but it's not good enough for me. If you, uh, if you, if you will follow a kind of concept, if you have a concept, then that is not enough. And quantum blur, is absolutely a quantum uh, software helped me uh, to help me to working once again as an analog painter, as a painter, as an artist. Because the results uh, I at the end I will get are uh, um, determined by myself, and this is a huge difference. And this mm -hmm. is a great tool. And so I will show you some examples how quantum. Because then I started to experiment with the, with the software. Oh, quantum blur is working because I also realized there are few more possibilities as only to be a kind of in dialogue and just looking at those pictures and be be, be impressed. Uh, quantum blur also helped me to transform very easy shapes, very easy basic ideas because everything at the beginning has to be easy. The idea, the uh, became then at the end very complex. At the, at the beginning, have to be very Spontaneously and 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 this like this like the like the very very easy shapes they will turn and playing with those basic ideas like this they they mean nothing this is just I put some colors and and, and shapes and play with they're like a child this is very this is so cool and playing with this at the at the end or uh, help me. We, um, of course, with the using of quantum blur, helped me develop uh, extremely complex ideas, like this, for example. 
And you have to remember the, the picture before. It was absolutely easy. It was like like the uh, like the pictograms yesterday. Yeah, it's this is what I really what I really think. This is the, the most powerful uh, um, the, the, mm, mm, thinking by using quantum blur. Based on simple idea, best best uh, uh, based on very uh, very um, spontaneously uh, move create a very complex world like this. It's there. There are just few examples, but it was enough for me to uh, to um, to continue the, the processes and to develop a completely new world. And this is also quantum. This is quantum work. This is a quantum technology in the hand of artists. Why the picture are look like this? And they have, of course, they have a lot of uh, aesthetic qualities, but um, uh, the, the point is that, um, no, I forgot the point, but uh, anyway, I started. <laughs> I will show you so example, and I I will put text to the, the moment uh, when I uh, I just have more picture today. I, this is not about I don't want to convince you with my stories. I will just show you that quantum technology is also a you have a question though. I thought the quantum the quantum technology can be also extremely useful for express myself uh, as an artist. And just for you to know, you will, this is, can you see here interference effect? Yeah, of course. And this is beautiful. This is a landscape also. And maybe, and this is my hope in the future, this is still about the aesthetic. The quantum web picture are great. And they can be also very realistic. It's, it's uh, everything based on very, very simple uh, science. And because it's art, then still there is a question how to present the art, the quantum the art, for example. And so the digital ones, the digital picture can be printed for that. Or they can be, uh, they can be shown as a video, a video presentation, the video like here. But still, there, this is not what I really appreciate. It, it was a kind of exhibition. That, the, 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 um, the screen is very large, but for this kind of video presentation, we still need uh, special rooms, uh, a ton of equipment, and this is not how art should communicate with us. And the next step in developing quantum art is to go from digital back to analog. And I decide, this is also an experiment, I decide to cut in carpets. Because it's also quantum. I got the idea back uh, on the way back to Berlin for visiting Marcel, uh, in Zurich, and cast, uh, the carpets is absolutely, it's a kind of combination of the quantum art I developed Three dimensionally on, on, on the screens with with painting. When I paint something, when I when I just simulate a kind of three dimensional effects, and here I with a tasking, with dealing with stuff, and with working with my own hands based on a one. This is the uh, the starting point is also a quantum picture. I develop a kind of three dimensional picture. They can be. Also using other screens, this is just an experiment, and can get completely a new, can speak completely new language uh, language to you, and uh, and this is how I see the kind of development of quantum blur, starting starting with digital through starting with analog to the digital to uh, back to uh, to to uh, to analog in diverse shapes and, and possibilities. I was, um, for which reason? Because I never, I never wanted to quit. Of course, quantum, quantum blur 
or uh, artificial intelligence, the softwares, the programs, the computer itself, they are extremely great tools and they offer you, uh, as an artist, great possibilities. But I never wanted to quit the paint. I wanted always what I wished. I wanted to create a kind of hybrid systems where many different ways to express myself can be connected, where, where digital will be mixed with, with, with analog. And so in this way, I can still be a painter and not really a digital picture. There is maybe there is a kind of uh, a concept behind because as I said, at the beginning is something painted, then transformed with a, with a quantum blur. And at the end, tasked to it with the hands. And the, the tasking, the carpets can be used as a, for example, screens or can be understand as a memory cards, for example. Yeah, you can read it, but in the yeah, there is some there are some ideas. I'm very uh, very flashed uh, of the uh, idea of using carpets uh, as a as a kind of uh, um, uh, memory card based on the idea uh, of of uh, of Konrad Suzer when he is also arbeited with uh, he is also worked with uh, with. Uh, um, with a carpet producer. And so what is the next? I don't know. Uh, this is, this, everything is open, but there was a job, a small example of what quantum technology and quantum physics can be also be. And, and maybe uh, also an example how, of uh, how uh, artists can be uh, with those, with the ideas, uh, artistic ideas and with the artistic method can be also, uh, Became a partner or science or, sci or, or, or uh, scientist, but uh, but maybe uh, um, in opposite, that will be nice someday. Have uh, art uh, uh, scientist in in atelier in working on artistic projects, painting picture, casting carpets, and thinking about the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Uh, there are, I suppose there will be a lot of questions. So let's start with someone who didn't ask a question today, Chelsea. Yeah, excellent talk. Thank you so much. And I'm really, I, I would love to learn more about the, like, how quantum blur specifically, or like, you know, it's like seeing the process of using it and stuff. But obviously, you know, this is, as you've said, this isn't like the right medium to be doing it um, here. But I guess like one thing I wanted to ask is, Stepping aside from quantum blur, but going back to some of the very first things that you were talking about, um, you know, about like the tendency that there is, um, you know, of like the one way collaborations between art and science, what would it really look like in your vision to have like artists and scientists collaborating as true equals and on a level playing field within like the development of quantum technologies and quantum art? Thank you for the question. I about uh, I have no uh, concrete idea with quantum blur. I have just few ideas. They they are just kind of in my head. But I started the, I developed a concept with uh, using AI uh, uh, as a kind of platform. Mm -hmm. uh, the AI muse, for example, as a kind of platform for for people from completely different disciplines uh, to create something new. Some, some of course we painted picture because I'm painter, mm -hmm. but. With, the, with using the science and using the, the neural networks, uh, it's worked for every creative person, it's not only for, for painter. And fascinated was the, 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 uh, the fact that at the end, really at the end, the persons they never painted before, uh, they was never, they never thought, they even thought that I'm not creative at the end of the session using the AI systems and painted with me as an assistant, they was absolutely flashed and 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 they developed skills and fascination for to do something with the hands, not digital, and to 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 uh, to talking the the artistic language like never before. And this is a kind of proof that uh, that we artists have to develop 
have, have to invite you in our studio and and started to to use in order to invite it you started to use your bodies your whole your whole bodies for create something your sensoric mm -hmm. and maybe that will be also then uh, very helpful in your in your uh, in your cognitive art of working uh um, yes, thank you very much please everyone. please shout uh thank you very much Roman, for this inspiring presentation um i wanted to ask about like one specific thing i mean you had this uh, in your presentation at the moment where you were showing this cave like room you know the exhibition where you have the video on the wall yeah. and then the big projectors mm -hmm. and it's actually at this point i was thinking well interesting what you're doing Interesting also that it ends up at the same medium that we already know. And then on the next slide, you come up with carpet. Brilliant. So I'm telling you what you think it's a good, it's a good story. Also because the carpet, you know, it connects back to the early idea of the weaving machine, first three, the sensor yeah. of the computer, and now with quantum technology we're at the end, or mm -hmm. currently at the status quo. Uh, so I think carpet is an interesting medium. I wanted to ask though, did you explore other media to express quantum art, whatever that might be. So I, my, my question is, would you think there is a specific media that represents this new technology that allows us to make art? Uh, cool, very interesting ideas. I have, I, I don't know, but this is a work in progress, you know? This is just, it's taken a lot of time to produce a kind of uh, artistic objects and so, there, there, there will be some kind of continuity. And of course, I do not know everything about, uh, I, I have no idea about a lot of things. And so they will be cool to, to explore new fields and connect the, the different methods. But of course, this can be happened only on the a, on a, on a, on a bottom, on the base of, of kind of cooperation, interdisciplinary cooperation. Yeah, and this is, I'm open and I'm thinking that this is absolutely the future of art and maybe of everything to be more, uh, to, to be, to be more connected. Uh, Lydia, then Anna. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I really like Josie's question, I want to think about that. Um, how would you, where would you envision a world where in quantum, technology was presented to uh, the public, uh, not necessarily outreach, but I just meant the public perception of quantum as something that is kind of very technical and very, like very elitist, I would, maybe that's not the right word, but that's just very exclusive. Um, how, where, where could art be more visible so that people can have a much wider creative and interdisciplinary impression of I would say yeah uh, as, a, as, a, as a paint I would say everywhere we, we can show and so on your screens on your telephone and whatever um I, I don't know let's develop a kind of idea together because I saw yesterday your presentation and the pictograms and this I was very flashed and so let's let's uh, let's let's uh, let's do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the one of the things that you did with you, and I think the people who came, I think it was maybe a handful of scientists, and the, the rest was, you know, mm. I, I also hate the term general audience, but, you know, not people who don't professionally work uh, as scientists. Um, and so that, that, I mean, that felt like a good, or at least that felt bringing like an audience that typically wasn't engaged with quantum mm -hmm. to seeing something related to quantum. Um, so I, I wonder whether that, I mean, uh, those spaces that, you know, the spaces where you typically show art as well, um, whether those would be a good starting point or that, I mean, I, I, sure. it doesn't have to be new spaces. Necessarily. For sure, exhibitions and then, yes. Art museums and art galleries, but I have a question to your art. Where did you lost less time? Uh, when, when did you did you lost was less time in in the art gallery or uh, in the art museum? 
Do we need to say that? Yeah, then. Two, two weeks ago. So yeah, you you are the one. This is the problem. Nobody from from yeah, the people there in museums you can see always the same parasols. They I don't know why. Maybe because the artistic complex are so too complicated or not so that sexy like they should be or not. This is the point. And so I'm thinking that cooperation is the solution, for example, to mix, uh, to combine some 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 projects. And then in order to going to the to the public, because then the, the possibility that that uh, you have and it's okay. Okay, okay. That that may be that may be uh, will be the option to to create a, a, a to communicate the art in the bigger scale, or the not only art but quantum uh, as well. Yeah. Okay, we will accept one question from Anna. We have an online question, and then we will go to break. <laughs> I still don't heard how it actually works. Uh, could you just re-explain the quantum blur part or how the quantum uh, AI or uh, I'm not sure how it works. It's dangerous. No, I don't explain you. But I will invite you to the website. This is really everything about how the technique, how the quantum blur is working. The uh, quantum blur or what I uh, present at the beginning. The first slide, I was, yeah. Also, Anna, there is a paper on it. Oh, there is something, something what I really appreciate. The, more, the, the most important things in my life, one of the most important things happened here, right? The, the cooperation, the, the scientists working on quantum blur, very high level scientists mentioned me in the, in, uh, my, my, in, uh, my inputs in, in the scientific paper. It was like uh, getting some kinds of, no, Oscar or nobody. <laughs> okay, uh, our final question from one to Clarissa, who was the, uh, here last year. Uh, what could the art generated using quantum computers exemplify or tell us about quantum computers would do vis a vis classical computers? How could art be used to challenge the affordances and promises of people? I need a week to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We we just we, we are. I'm working on it. This is just the beginning. I would say this is really a very early stage of creating some kind of useful cases in order to uh, to uh, to dealing with quantum uh, computing. Is there something like quantum computer? I don't know. But I am just an artist. I just uh, I have no solutions. I just create the situations, and they have to. Uh, Invite you to to thinking about and uh, and, and to work on on on, yeah, on this to answer find the answer for all the questions. Okay, uh, so let's thank Roman again. Uh, so uh, I have the honor to chair the next panel on the role of QT in convergent technologies debate, space, bio, AI, and more. Uh, there will have been some changes, as Zeki announced yesterday, uh, mainly the changes that some of the panelists originally uh, considered to be talking in this panel are not here. The only panelists we have, and we are very happy to, be, uh, to have you here, is Sibylle Bauer. And the, this is the one change. The other change is that we have two panelists that were from the last session yesterday uh, on, what was it, grassroots initiative in QT. We had to move them from yesterday to this session. So I am happy to tell you the new plan, which is we will start with a talk by Josie. Uh, we will then continue with a talk by Ulrike and uh, end the panel with a talk by the Sibylle. Um, so with further Without further ado, I'm happy to give the word to Josie. I think she at least does not need any introduction from me, from my side, but maybe you could yeah. say a few words of it. Yeah, um, for any of you who were here yesterday, I'm Josie Meyer. Um, I'm at the University of Colorado Boulder in the mountain west of the US. Um, I'm also uh, one of the core members of the Quantum Ethics Project team. Um, but in this part, um, last time we talked, 
a little bit more about the curriculum development stuff, um, but in talking about grassroots initiatives, I also just wanted to talk about what it's like to be doing all of this work from a purely grassroots perspective with the um, Bottom Ethics Project. And what lessons this might have moving forward, both for folks that are doing grassroots initiatives, as well as also what might be learned from doing, or from folks that aren't in grassroots um, necessarily positions, but how those in more formal positions can support initiatives like this. Um, already discussed this, I wasn't sure what order the so yeah, the QEP is a quantum ethics project, it's a grassroots all volunteer organization. We have a global membership pretty much all over the world. Um, right now there's 200 plus current members on Discord channel. Um, I would say the optimistic thing is that we have all these people who are excited about quantum ethics. The pessimistic thing is it's just social media activism and not leading anywhere. Um, depends on your view of that. Most of Importantly, it's almost entirely grad students, postdocs, and other early career scientists that are actively contributing to the, um, including several undergrads that are actively contributing to this work. Um, and uh, one time we were described as a ragtag group of grad students and postdocs fighting against hope to prevent a second world war, um, which there's some truth in that. Um, I can explain later, but like it's, um, but yeah, it was found at the time by Joan Arrow, who was in 2021 was a grad student who basically was like, somebody needs to be talking about this. It's important that we get, um, or that we coin the term quantum ethics and get this vision out there. So she basically just got a website, decided I'm going to found something called the Quantum Ethics Project and then just with blind faith made this happen. I joined about uh, March of 2023. So I'm fairly new, but then quickly got involved in a lot of the curriculum stuff. You know. Pillars, education, research, diversity, and outreach. I talked about the education stuff a lot yesterday. We can talk more about this, but these are some of the other things that we do. Um, but, you know, just asking, what has the Quantum Ethics Project so, done so far? So we have this, you know, Discord server that's active all over the world. And I would say what's really valuable the Discord server is not just so much that there's a bunch of people on there talking about quantum ethics, but that informally on this, I can't tell you how many research projects and invited talks and other things have come just out of the informal network that happens with all these sort of people that are talking about quantum ethics in one space. And by the way, if you want to join the Discord server, um, there will be a QR code at the end. Um, we have our suite of modular curriculum materials that I talked about yesterday that I've been involved in. We published a paper um, with the education team uh, last fall. Um, this was before my time, but hosting a quantum ethics summer school at uh, Perimeter Institute, but also around the world, it's created this awesome set of all these talks were then, they were created um, largely by students who were at um, Perimeter Institute at the time, and they created this uh, beautiful YouTube series that folks can go see on our channel. Um, they've been, if you want to make it part of courses and stuff, this is another one of our educational initiatives. Um, Students are, um, through this, have been mentored on a variety of research projects, just some things that I know, uh, just snaps out of things right now, that there's undergrads that are working on coding up quantum algorithms for variational quantum algorithms on real hardware, benchmarking them, basically to see how much the limitation, how relevant or not relevant these are in the uh, NISC uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum era, um, and rather than just the ideal circumstances under which the um, they were proposed by the original developers so that we can see like what's hype and what's reality on the timescales of these algorithms. Um, there's a group working on the energy, or there's a couple of students right now working on the energy, quantifying the energy demands of the quantum internet. Basically, if you were to construct a quantum internet, how much energy would it use? And my understanding of the project so far is basically that some of the work suggests that maybe a global quantum internet may not actually end up panning out to be practical given the energy usage of it, which again, this is this way we're not making decisions based on infrastructure that is going to consume far more energy than it's worth. Uh, um, privacy implications of blind quantum computing, you know, again, potentially looking at what are the, you know, privacy, cybersecurity, human rights implications of emerging uh, proposed technologies so that we can better work on policy and regulation. Talks, panels, workshops, um, so basically enough tooting my, our own horn though for this. So then the, thanks. 
Next question then becomes affordances and challenges um, for grassroots initiatives in quantum technology. Because, you know, we, in and in particularly the responsible quantum technology. So we've had a lot of these success, but we've also had a fair number of challenges, um, up to and including our founder, Joan Arrow, partly as a result of being so focused on uh, quantum ethics stuff, resulted in her effectively being, uh, so sh her advisor lost, was denied tenure for, and she was unable to get another uh, position at her university because no one else wanted to mentor somebody that was so focused on quantum ethics and she got a number of other things. So she actually had to leave her graduate position and lost her visa to stay in Canada. Oh. So there is a real risk to folks that are doing these, these sort of things, that the system is not necessarily set up to support those folks that are doing really awesome work that's making a lot of work around the globe, but not necessarily um, trans fitting well into specific academic disciplines. Um, so what are the benefits? What, what has worked really well? Well, there's power in, the, in networks. You know, we have this Discord server. So many, so much of what's got on from it isn't official QEP projects. For instance, all the work that has happened with the curriculum development that I got brought in. I've been very clear. I don't want to be in the governance of the quantum ethics project. I don't have capacity for that, but guess what? I'm, I was already doing a whole bunch of research work on uh, curriculum development and quantum ethics. This helped build a network that I'm able to actually take what was a side project in my PhD and turn it into a whole, that I was struggling to get support for, turn it into a whole chapter of my thesis and um, one and a couple, and a number of publications. Um, this has also, you know, has led to, you know, a paper that I'm working on with some other folks, you know, just communicating within the quantum ethics project about, um, um, quote unquote, Americanness um, empire and where the, how quantum technologies are fitting in um, global geopolitics. Mm -hmm. This never would have had, the, the group of people that are on this never would have gotten together were it not for these sort of networks. Um, second lesson, importance of social media um, for getting people together. And this is kind of ironic as a media addict, I refuse to basically stay on these platforms at all. But what I can mention is that they have been very valuable for the folks in the, um, or for, for folks that do use them. Um, also, even more analog channels like our blog have become really useful because we have now an opportunity to publish things that we actually control that isn't necessarily the academic publications limitations um, to get ideas out there. Um, and then finally, early movers can define the narrative. The, the major contribution of the quantum ethics project is not that we were the first people talking about quantum ethics or that, again, you know, this whole thing is quantum ethics, the question from yesterday, is quantum ethics a, a discipline? It is because we say so. Mm -hmm. And this is basically the, the other um, lesson being that if we, thanks, if we wait for, um, if we wait for the academy for institutions to say, yes, this is a valid form of research, we're gonna be dealing with the too little, too late problem. Meanwhile, if we go down and assert that it's a legitimate form of research that we need, and academic discipline that we need to be talking about, and we act as if, and tell people start listening to us, then events like this start happening. And all of a sudden, this dream no longer seems so, um, this no longer seems far-fetched, it becomes its own self-fulfilling prophecy. And we've been able to, I think one of the other things that we've avoided is much of the co-optation by industry because this was coined so early by grassroots organizations, the QEP and otherwise, we set the narratives, not the... Um, so challenges, um, issues with, we need formal infrastructure, the journals, the funding, the advisors. We've been struggling to get, to even find a thousand dollars to support graduate students that have a paper coming on a side project on like environmental impacts of quantum technologies. How in the world are we supposed to be scaling these sort of things when we can't get a thousand dollars, when we can't get somebody to part with a thousand dollars to support what would otherwise basically be a volunteer effort? Um, so, you know, we need journals that will be publish our work. We need funding to make these sort of things happen. We need advisors that are willing to say, yes, you can spend 10% of your time working on these sort of things mm -hmm. during your PhD. Turnover, grad students and postdocs are transitory. We had like five or six people on the QEP staff list. Now it's me and Joan at the time, and I'm not on the officially on any sort of thing for governance. People turn over. That's a challenge, but we work with it. We see what we can do. And finally, 
plenty of funding exists for who can access it. Um, it's a chicken and egg problem. How do we apply for grants when there are grassroots organizations that are have lots of money or, or that don't have any money and we can't, we don't necessarily have the skills to write a formal grant proposal. And anyone that we will work it with is gonna siphon 60% of the, the money that we do get off for their own administrative expenses while we're doing all the work. So again, some things to think about, especially on the policy side, how can we get around these issues? Because there's plenty of people that want to do this. We keep getting stymied by these sort of issues. We've done a lot. Maybe y'all can help us. Yeah. So basically grassroots organizing and quantum tech ethics has been surprisingly successful, but we also need the formal structures to back us um, if we want any of this work to go beyond purely grassroots and start making a difference more broadly. Great, thank you, Josie. So we have some time for questions. Let's see two questions over there. Yes, Peter, please. Uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, the talk. And it's really impressive. I should really this. Um, you also have the project as kind of this project that you, you have to define a narrative because that is yours. Uh, and then quantum ethics uh, is, is, is right instead of, uh, let's say, the institutions would mm -hmm. define it. Okay, well, let's accept that. Uh, okay. I will also say not, that I will but, not part of the quantum ethics project at the time. But, but, but here's program. my question. My question is, you're now in Europe, and there are also lots of groups which do quantum ethics. Yeah. Um, I'm myself part of quantum ethics. Uh, there's Innsbruck, there's Karlsruhe, uh, there's uh, Munich. How do you look at the narratives they present? I don't think it's necessarily It's not contradictory, it would be my, we need lots of individual voices on it. What I'm, or I guess the sort of thing is, I would not say that the quantum ethics project by any means has a monopoly on what quantum ethics means. But what it is, is that we got ourselves early out as one voice amid many of the other voices. And like, for instance, the amazing work that your group is doing. Um, like this is, and I think the important thing being that because we got ourselves out there early, we have not, it's not necessarily that we are responsible for the fact that quantum ethics, you know, has become a field or something. That's not what I'm trying to apply. It's that by getting names out early, um, we have the ability to start cooperating and have more voices than just those that easily would have had the institutional funding to do it. Question. How, how do you see the collaboration between what you do, which is nice, and what is here? How do you see the, the relation the narrative? Well, I hope that in time they start to emerge and become more of one. This is the whole point of the, you know, this talk. There's a lot of people that want to do this. Um, there's also lots of folks that are doing amazing work in more institutional positions that are doing this. And really, you know, we want to work together. We want those opportunities. Reach out, reach out to some of us that are doing this. Not all of us have the opportunity to be working in your lab, but a lot of us would love to work with you. You will have the journals, do that the journals here in this city. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, I see three more questions. So we go to Leah, Oksana, and then we can. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, maybe have some questions about about I um ideas of how kind of grassroots organizations kind of strike the balance between recruiting and and like as you said, oftentimes people in the, or especially younger and students are really transitory, but also um, it's kind of hard, harder to sustain these. Mm -hmm grassroots initiatives over, over time and watch it transform. Like what's a what's a kind of responsible way to do that? But um maybe I'll save that for the panel or maybe I'll find discussion. Um, my question is um so uh, I was considering and thinking the Unitary Fund Fund nonprofit does an annual open source survey. Mm -hmm. And something that I could see as being important to fund as well as could not be possible to do without uh quantum ethics ethicist networks. Um, well, um, the networks, as you described, 
um, is an annual survey on quantum ethics and values. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's just like, I'm kind of throwing an idea at you, but um, yeah. um, but uh, uh, is that something that, that uh, you think could be possible to do and um, valuable to do? Yeah, I would say it's valuable to do. Um, the important thing being that we're kind of at capacity with the sort of folks that we have. So if, again, if you want to see these sort of things happen, this is the reality with grassroots initiatives. We would love to back you in supporting all these sort of things or finding someone to do it. Just giving me more ideas of what I can do with my already limited time that's overstretched doesn't make more things happen. <laughs> so I think that's the, um, so, you know, I, again, I think it's the sort of things, how can we, if there's interest in these sort of things, how could we potentially help us get a grant that could actually fund, for instance, Joan or somebody who is on the side trying to apply for jobs just to get, you know, through, you know, ju or just to keep funding going so that we can focus on these sort of things that we're passionate about while keeping ourselves, you know, a roof over our heads. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so in the interest of time, I would say we merge your questions, maybe first Sana, first Tina, and then Oksana, and if it's okay for you, Josie, you hear both questions and you answer yeah. both. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is also about uh, mm. collaboration. So, mm. so I, I have um, I have a, a, a company of science communication, mm. and I see I could maybe use some of the curriculum material in one of our science yeah. communication workshops because then it's also about we also work on like uh, mm. inclusion. How would a collaboration like look like that? Like, uh, of course, like if I use your material, you would get paid for that. But you know, but uh, have you done such collaborations before? How would it be in reality? Thank you. Yeah. And Oksana? You, you also have the question? No? Yes, I, I don't remember yeah. anymore. So the, it's all about collaboration as well and the money too. So it's actually all related. Where would you like to get a grant from? I also have a couple of years and I promise I, I give myself uh, to write it. Mm -hmm. I'm available for, for being a part of you, whatever, in Italy as you wish. So I'm there. So two very, very interesting topics. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what, what it, and this is something we've been discussing a lot. Jamma, I know that you've kind of reached out to us before and it has fallen through. Uh, we take full responsibility for it. You reached out right at the time that we had a massive leadership transition and all the people and a whole bunch of people who were before on that ended up having to leave unexpectedly. So that's totally on us, but that's also kind of the realities of working in a grassroots place. Um, so I do understand, yeah. yeah, but yeah, no, I, I take absolutely some responsibility for not following up with you. Um, but I, I guess what I would say is, yeah, I mean, even if it was something enough to, for instance, be able to hire, say, Joan as a, you know, for a year working on some sort of thing so that we can spend enough time actually going and getting the bigger like NSF grants or those sort of things, that would be huge. Um, again, just getting past this chicken and egg problem. If we can get enough time to focus somebody, maybe Joan, maybe myself, maybe Rodrigo. They, we've talked about a, a bunch of folks. I'll be graduating in a year. So same thing. You know, We would love to be able to just like take somebody who's been very involved in it and just have enough time for them to focus on actually getting the infrastructure needed to scale these sort of things. Um, in terms of other things, you know, we are we would be happy to license you know, materials. We're also working with like, for instance, QSteam and several other organizations. Um, the challenge being that it's, what we don't want to do is box ourselves in and limit our ability to, um, around intellectual property agreements, which has become sort of a, a thing that like, if you want to support us, that's fine. But what we don't want to do is result in our curricular materials getting locked down in one particular use case and then be unable to use our own work. Okay, thank you, Josie. I guess with the second question, we just say as soon as you find a proposal or a grant, uh, reach out to Oksana. She okay. Will be thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a bit of freedom as, as chair to use more time because there's some. Uh, speakers missing later in the program, but uh, still we have to uh, move on. Uh, but thanks for all the discussions, questions. Next speaker is um, Technology Works, Bart Karstens.
Ratana uh, Institute. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, what I'm going to tell is about uh, a new quantum paradigm in international diplomacy. And there's actually a lot of uh, resonance with what uh, Mira and Douglas have said before. And uh, uh, But, um, well, there's also overlap uh, between these talks, which I couldn't know uh, before this uh, event. So, but I came across this notion of a quantum, new quantum paradigm, a paradigm shift that we need for international diplomacy. And I thought for this uh, conference, I well try to understand what the, the papers I read about this uh, this uh, new paradigm, what it should be, and uh, but of course we should also have an image of who is this new type of international diplomat and quantum technology, and maybe I should, should have taken Douglas or Mira or even uh, Sibyl for that, but I settled on Zeki, of course. <laughs> uh, because I follow his LinkedIn uh, profile, and I know you get all the pictures of all these. Uh, well, they do. Well, Dubai, Seattle, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Australia. I was joking on your profile that you are in more places than any wave function can be <laughs> Well, let's see after this talk if, if and who uh, ever fits, most fits the, 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 the new paradigms for international diplomacy and technology. Um, so actually we live in a quantum age and that has also been said earlier at this conference that it's about 100 years of, uh, old quantum mechanics and we can say that since then we live in a quantum age. And um, perhaps the most visible results of this uh, quantum revolution are uh, nuclear warfare and the information age, so everything that has to do with computers and internet and so on is all based on, uh, at the end of the day, on quantum mechanics and the new world. Uh, physics that came about in the 1920s. And I read this paper by Randolph Mank, who also uh, uh, calls for a new uh, paradigm in the international diplomacy. And he says, well, for most of the time, this has not uh, been accompanied, this age with uh, the right kind of diplomacy. So it's actually a promise and peril pattern when uh, after a period of not doing anything, uh, something goes wrong, there's a threat looming, there's risks, and the, the, the whole uh, uh, business of diplomacy, international diplomacy, is management of risk, and uh, make sure that things do not go out of hand. So the United Nations is in part uh, created because of this. There are a lot of treaties. There's the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, well, we had this talk by uh, Sibyl, which uh, is a kind of risk management uh, um, approach. Uh, um, kind of fits this, let's say, old uh, uh, way of doing diplomacy. And now we have this quantum technology 2.0, so the new quantum technology based on these beautiful uh, uh, properties at the quantum level. And will we do this promise and peril again, or will we finally have learned our lesson and do something new? Now, some, some authors, I found a few, argue actually for a quantum paradigm shift in international diplomacy. So the old paradigm is all about competition management and races between countries or blocks of countries. And we find this in the weapon race, AI race, and now the new quantum race. It is stunted by uh, scientific nationalism. And most policy is like after the fact. So post-policy, things go wrong, need to be managed. You know, okay, competition is uh, it's a primary thing, but we need to make sure that things do not go out, out of hand. And therefore, we have treaties and stuff like that. A paradigm shift would be, while not, of course, uh, eradicating all kinds of competition, but changing, let's say, the order of things, and let a lot of global challenges take center states and come up with more anticipatory ex ante policy. That's a kind of different way of looking at things. And, well, the question, if we take this seriously, um, we must ask if our institutions nowadays are good enough and well, I go into a, a number of issues uh, in, in the next slides. Um, but, but this is, if I interpret it well, because it's not so clear in this paper, what nobody says this is a new paradigm. But we need a new paradigm that comes with lists of uh, all kinds of things. I also have a few of these lists uh, but uh, later on, but it's not clear. Well, this is what I, let's say, extracted from these uh, stories. And you can just have a broad uh, perspective on it that the quantum paradigms for all technology diplomacy, the broad application of it, or you can narrow it down and say, you know, quantum paradigm for uh, diplomacy only holds for the new quantum world. 
I don't care. So uh, it can be both. Um, now, why exactly do we need a new paradigm for international technology diplomacy? Now, here comes uh, a list of things that uh, have been discussed uh, in the previous talk. So I think I can, I, I will briefly mention them. So first of all, the world is more globalized than ever uh, in economic, cultural, and also in uh, things like uh, the risk that, uh, uh, or the challenges that we face. Um, so a message or something happens in some part of the world, it can, in a few minutes, it can involve another part of the world and even uh, actively contribute. Economic, economic ties are, are, are interrelated are stronger than ever. And well, there are a lot of societal and environmental challenges, second point, which are global, like climate change, uh, food supply chain, pandemics, migration, you name it. You know all these things. We have these SDGs were formulated to, uh, to, uh, to address uh, these kind of uh, global issues. Um, then the assumption is, of course, that the development of science and technology is crucial in solving these challenges. We need science and technology in order to cope with the problems. And of course, the development of science and technology is a, in, in itself an international process. And this has been said a lot of times today, uh, that the exponential uptake of technology, so this increase in confluence, that's becoming, an, 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 let's say, a kind of multiplier or, or increasing uh, intensifier of the process. So uh, AI and quantum, or uh, traditional computing and quantum, or uh, human, uh, kind of human and artificial uh, uh, interactions, or inter internet of things. So you can think a lot of these conferences are taking up. Um, well, multinational companies, they are key players in uh, and becoming more and more important in development of uh, science, technology, and innovation. So how should we deal with them? They do not think in terms of national bound boundaries. Uh, Cybersecurity and military security are international affairs. We have discussed this already. Then the quantum divide. So many countries do not have a quantum agenda, strategy, or roadmap. What will this bring? Uh, will we get this quantum divide? Amira just mentioned that. Um, international partnership and collaboration are necessary to achieve quantum advantage. And unknown and unforeseen effects of technology may require swift international response. So if you see this list, everything is about some uh, global, I think. It is a, a, a pressing global issue. And um, if we look at the possible impediments to prudent development and employment of quantum technology, um, well, what's then often mentioned is that our, the ethics will uh, go wrong. Uh, something ethical, the ethical framework is not, uh, not being followed well. Uh, cybersecurity, if uh, post-quantum uh, uh, cryptography and quantum key distribution are not going to put into place, we have a huge problem. Uh, if interoperability with prevailing system fails, we have a huge problem. Uh, if we don't uh, have uh, regulatory frameworks and new standards, we have a huge problem. Well, okay, if we take this all together, and that's my third list, we actually come with what should the new quantum diplomacy aim for. And then again, on this list are a number of things that have already been discussed here. And I think this room of uh, 30 or so people are already uh, completely in, in favor of all this. But outside of the room, perhaps this is still a message that, uh, that, that requires to be, uh, to be set and maybe to, to be put like with all the issues listed uh, uh, together. Uh, so we need standards and regulations. Um, um, a discussion on ethical uh, uh, implications. So this is the work of the World Economic Forum is already in there. Uh, this year of the 25th year of quantum science and technology could be a very good way to raise awareness, um, address cyber security challenges, and prioritize international collaboration, companies, and education, support capacity building in developing countries, facilitate partnerships between governments, academia, and private sector, incorporate expert controls and trade agreements. Well, this is only going to work uh, properly, I think, if you do it internationally, if you have uh, expert control uh, agreements between just a few countries, it will not, uh, will not work. Um, another, another interesting one is the notion of reciprocity. Um, if we are going to make the relations, economic, maybe strategic relations explicit, we should use this notion of reciprocity. So uh, make a kind of interdependence uh, into this, uh, this relation by sharing maybe investment and profit, 
by share, uh, uh, dividing, uh, common, uh, taking common responsibility and dividing uh, uh, each task of the, the cooperating partners. Otherwise, the, the, this is a uh, uh, Swedish researcher, Tommy Shi has uh, pointed this out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, a reflex of the nation states will be to, to become protectionist again and protect their own economic interests and security. And we get the old way of doing mm -hmm. international diplomacy. So uh, an example of that is the U.S. Chips Act that actually puts a lot of sanctions on cooperation with China. He gives it as an example of, let's say, the, the wrong way to, to, to move forward. Um, okay, devise a backup plan, set, oh, set, set up oversight bodies and proactive, well, this is a general message, I believe, uh, the proactive research and negotiation to find the right balance between openness and security. If we do not do this in the proactive sense, we will not move to the new paradigm, we will stick in the old paradigm and we get this, uh, this peril situation in which we do damage control. And I come to my final slide. So, Peter can ease down. Uh, <laughs> so, how are we going to do this? Do we need new institutional bodies to really make it make uh, uh, the quantum the quantum shift in international diplomacy and the quantum paradigm work? So, we already have United Nations, UNESCO, OECD. Uh, you name all these organizations. Do we need something new? Do we need something else? Do we need an extension of maybe some of these bodies to uh, to come to some kind of global technology government? I don't know. And how should we set this up? Problem driven, like IPCC, the the, the successful uh, or in, in some ways successful uh, intergovernmental uh, body on uh, climate change is problem driven. Uh, uh, there is a problem, and we uh, well uh, um, um, arrange parties around to solving that problem. But it can also be goal driven. Let's say new ways of uh, uh, energy, like maybe with uh, on the hydrogen or, or or through quantum. Uh, so then that that could be a slightly different way of setting things up. It can also be technology driven. There's just quantum technology here, and that needs to be managed. Those are different ways of going about if you think about uh, setting up maybe new institutional bodies. And what does it mean for technology assessment? I mean, Global TA doesn't really exist at the moment. And there's a very interesting book that's published last year on technology assessment in the globalized world. I don't know if you know it. I read the book actually, and it, it contains a lot of good ideas of, of exploratory uh, in, in many ways, uh, or of how to uh, to uh, go this about. And actually, in Vienna, there will actually be a conference on the team that how to go global as TA, so TA goes global. And uh, well, one of the questions they raise in the book is how to connect this global TA to uh, uh, decision making governmental bodies. Should that be national decision making governmental bodies that have a kind of global TA input, or should we create, let's say, a new uh, global uh, decision-making governmental body with really executive power, uh, uh, which should then have a good TA uh, uh, backup or a kind of ETAS international or Rathano international, I don't know how, how, how we should call it, but uh, uh, something like that. And well, those are the questions we, uh, we uh, I think uh, are quite relevant and uh, well, we need to think about in the near future in order to make a paradigm shift work. If we don't, okay, we say in our existing paradigm and we muddle on like we, we always do, but we can make it perhaps a, a job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Um, so thanks a lot for that. Um, I mean, I love that. I, I would love to see a global ethos or like that. Um, but that's the problem with them. Um, I think the reasons for that were there already 15 years ago or so when you when you go to the recent slide, I would say all that or well, most of that was already 10, 15 years ago, some challenges we faced. So why should it work now? Is my question. Are we just slow? Like so now we find out and now we do it, or I don't know, like like what makes you optimistic that it could work now? I haven't said I'm optimistic. <laughs> Okay. I'm just saying that it would be good. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, why is it different now than 15 years ago? We had a pandemic. Uh, internet uh, uh, so integration it has been taken up explosively in the past 15 years. 
we have now this new uh, quantum discussion. I mean, there are there are continuous new developments that uh, that might tip towards a, a new way of uh, looking at things. But if you look at international politics, you see actually the opposite reaction. Maybe there's a lot of governments, including my own country, I must sadly say that are uh, quite nationalistic in the, their agenda, want to break down on, on this uh, kind of international cooperation. So that makes it extra important to, to get this message across, I believe, but uh, the tendency uh, may actually be, uh, be in the opposite direction in a lot of countries. Yeah. There are lots of questions, uh, so I already have to make a choice. Uh, so please be, be short. My question is, um, about institutional bodies, how do you ensure that they are global? So in Douglas's talk just now, he said that at the OECD Global Forum on Technology, anyone is allowed in the room, not just 38 member states. Um, um, for example, um, I'll give an example. So um, I am also a Taiwanese national and um, Taiwan is not allowed to join the World Health Organization, the pandemic or not, it's just not allowed because of geopolitical tensions. Um, is is there some way that these whatever is the inter international ETAS or what um, what kind of global governance? How do you ensure that it is truly global and inclusive and not um, kind of the same few countries dominating the discourse? Difficult, but yeah. First, try to just let get the, try to get everybody on board. That's the first step, I believe. And if some uh, country block things, yeah, okay, that's very difficult, of course. But the United Nations seem to be the model that uh, includes all countries in the world. Uh, IPCC is uh, discussed in this book, very interesting discussion about how that is organized and why it is so successful, with also a critical discussion. Well, the, the OECD is overrepresented, overrepresented, uh, like 80% of the uh, members of the IPCC come from OECD countries. But still, the data comes from all over the world. So there's a kind of layered uh, cooperation there. Uh, but th there's also discussion in the, in, the, uh, in the book about the limits of IPCC. Can we use IPCC as a working international body that has uh, that speaks to, let's say, all governments and uh, uh, use it as a kind of model to create maybe a new kind of institutional technology government institution that's why it's so interesting that the discussion is, is done in, uh, I think, in a very good way here to, 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 to highlight the good points and highlight that maybe the probably some of the problematic points. And inclusion is one of the, the discussion points there as well. Just, um, you had your, your, I don't know, remember, 15 goals for quantum diplomacy. And one of those goals was uh, a backup. Plan. I was just wondering, what do you imagine with this backup, like a technical backup plan, where I wonder how diplomats would build a technical backup plan or more like a backup plan for like global governance, where like, that's a huge, like, this was like, should be like, this would be enough for a whole organization to build a backup and not be just one of yeah. 11 goals for like, like an institute. <laughs> I should have called this a crisis preparedness and keep it safe. Because I don't know what uh, what the actually backup plan is that I took from, from one of the papers. I think it was in the context of cybersecurity. And if it, if we reach a Q day, and that is the, the, the analogy with D day, then we are too late and uh, the Chinese will maybe earlier Q day and then they take over everything because the whole internet will be, be broken. And think about this possibility of uh, a queue day and then devise a backup plan that you have something, I don't know how, but you have some idea how to uh, to, uh, to shut the door and, and, and to go on in a kind of uh, backup state or something. So it's a bit vague, but crisis preparedness you can relate to maybe. Uh, last yeah. question. The situation and where we're now in the development, as you say, edit, a war and the new version of it. Yes, so actually, 
first of all, the, one question was whether you would envisage something like the International Atomic Energy Agency, but for quantum yeah. as a model. Yeah. Um, and the second one, yeah, my observation, usually I'm the optimist on the panel, not the pessimist, but here the, the, the interesting thing is that people <laughs> years ago, I think it would have been more likely, now we're in a situation where everything is going in the opposite direction. So it's swimming even more upstream. Yeah. So I think one would need to be very creative in coming up with ways to move against that trend. And from my perspective of observing export controls, I sort of saw the um, the block mentality of the 80s and then in the 90s breaking up. I saw this sort of very one happy family export control world of the 2000s where you was working with Russia and China and uh, mm -hmm. nobody saw any problems. And then now it's swing sort of full scale back. Um, so you can conclude that it can also go back into the positive direction because it's on both sides. But I think it would take a lot of creative thought from all all of us to think about how we can actually help it swing back into the other direction because right now it's going definitely full full stream and in the opposite direction very much in terms of national thinking i think it's a good point i think the next session is even about this topic so just want to ask Deki, do you feel like the new international diplomats that we need now <laughs> I can bring people together and then a new diplomat in immersion. Okay, that will be yes. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So I will send this towards the audience so that you can see who's playing with their phone. Wonderful. So I'm not speaking to myself. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. Um, as already announced, I'm replacing Tim Smith from CERN. I'm Marion Scherling, who, for those who don't know me yet, I'm Senior Program Manager at JASTA, or working there um, since I've joined on the design, but also implementation of the Open Quantum Institute. Um, on the personal no note up front, I'm a sociologist by academic training uh, with a PhD in decision sciences and health sociology. And I've worked for quite some years now at think tanks um, in Geneva at the intersection of um, policy and emerging technologies. So before I reflect with you today on the multilateral governance of quantum technology from our JESTA perspective, um, I would like to kind of give you a super quick um, introduction to what JESTA actually does. Um, and um, then we'll um, introduce the OQI, Open Quantum Institute, as a concrete example for science diplomacy. Um, now, the belief that um, all humanity must benefit from the 21st century acceleration in uh, in sciences and, and technology, technological discoveries, um, led to the fact that um, the Geneva Science Diplomacy Anticipator Foundation was created. And we have noticed that Fun, it was quite a surprise to us. Um, the science community was not really considered um, as a stakeholder um, within the multilateral system. Yet we see that science um, is a key um, to tackle global challenges. So what we um, see um, is that there is a need to anticipate. Um, we already heard that in several talks today. Um, we need to anticipate profound changes to society. Um, we need to understand the multifaceted impact um, from disruption, but also we need to prepare for equal and inclusive use of powerful technologies um, and their capabilities. So this is where we see multilateral actors come into play and can contribute to something that we call the anticipatory science um, diplomacy. Now, as you all know, Geneva provides um, the perfect um, place to do so. Um, it um, has a framework in place that um, provides a forum for helping to make um, that connection happen. And um, this is um, basically the context where um, the JESTA uh, board of directors um, have decided um, early last year to fund and incubate the Open Quantum Institute. Um, with the support from the Swiss Foreign Affairs Department. Now, in short, the OKI that already has been kindly mentioned by Mira before um, is an initiative hosted by CERN, born at JESTA and supported by UBS. 
And its goal is to inclusively, we call it unleash um, the powers of quantum computing to ensure that um, in theory, everyone in the world can contribute to and benefit from the technology. We have around um, 180 experts and 40 partners, organizations from the public and private sectors and 20 plus countries who took part in the incubation of the OKI under the justice impetus. And what really reunites um, these unique, this unique community is the aim to make quantum computing available uh, in an open and transparent way. Um, I already saw that a few of you uh, participated um, in the launch um, back um, uh, in March, um, so a few weeks ago. And um, what was really, um, what made us um, feel optimistic is that we saw that actually there is a, a real appetite to kind of um, counter um, that hype, um, that um, attention to the threats um, um, rather than looking into, well, actually, what is the potential to address global challenges through the SDGs? Um, what can we do about that? Now, um, so one of the leading questions the OKI is responding to is how can we actually prepare the global community and ourselves for a responsible, um, and we can also say human-centered and inclusive use of quantum computing? And so um, we therefore um, focus on four core objectives that we call the four A's and I'll just present them very quickly so that you can get a grasp of um, what um, uh, we have been designing now for uh, a bit over a year. Um, so the, the first um, objective is all about use cases. So by accelerating applications for humanity and more specifically um, the multi-stakeholder implementation of solutions that use um, the potential of quantum computing um, to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, um, we aim at the OKI to contribute to shift the curse. And what we mean by that is to really enable um, the global quantum community to rebalance the focus and also resources towards uh, applications that are both beneficial to the SDGs, but also help to address um, global challenges. And so we try and we aim to provide clarity and, and, and counteract the type um, effects about areas where quantum computing could effectively be valuable, notably um, for UN organizations. So practically, that means that we have established um, now and we are now in, in, in the pilot and, and testing phase um, um, a methodology to develop um, SDG use cases of quantum computing for the SDGs that, that um, needs to kind of pass um, um, a process of um, five phases where we have um, different review expert teams um, um, testing the credibility, but also the scientific excellence um, of, of, of those developments. And so that's kind of trying to counteract um, that hype effects of, oh, actually we can use quantum computing for, for everything. So we really um, um, support what, what uh, I think was Mira said, um, there is no, um, um, no no um, um, solution that fits everything, but we really need to make sure that we um, focus on what is the context for a specific solution and is is, is quantum computing really um, um, the response um, to a, um, a, a um, specific challenge. Um, the second objective that I wanted to socialize with you is that um, the OKI um, works um, in total with 40 um, plus partners to provide global and inclusive equitable access to a pool of public and private quantum computers, but also simulators available via the cloud. And so um, here, um, this is all about looking into actually what does it take that um, everyone who is developing, um, or who is um, um, keen to support the development of quantum um, computing use cases for the SDGs can actually have um, access to the um, necessary infrastructure. And of course, um, adequate education, capacity building is needed to prepare ourselves for human-centered use of quantum computing. And um, we, um, in fact, have two priority target groups um, for the education offering. So the first uh, group are researchers and developers, but also entrepreneurs of quantum underserved geographies. So this is where um, it was mentioned um, here today as well, where um, the, the notion of, okay, how can we actually ensure that inclusivity um, 
um, is 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 a value that that is followed and fulfilled. Um, it's not an easy one to um, have underserved geographies um, um, included, but um, something that we uh, focus on and that we kind of tailor our tools um, towards. And then the second group are diplomats and, and more generally policymakers. Um, who um, we work closely with um, through um, either the use case development um, track or um, through um, the governance discussion. And that's actually the objective number four, um, as we see that multi-dialogue um, is key. Um, we believe that um, science and diplomacy must work together hand in hand to ensure that um, the breakthroughs benefit all humanity, not just um, a few. And so we um, provide a neutral forum to help shape multilateral governance of quantum computing for the SDGs. And that actually means that we are, um, and that's a difference to the OECD, for instance, we are not providing policy recommendations, but we um, provide the space where those um, recommendations are, or, or let's say the solutions are um, being developed. We have initiated and created um, the diplomatic dialogue now for quite some while. We started um, a bit, uh, well, actually two years ago um, in, in, in that area. And um, we um, are have and, and are still gathering guidance from the private sector, academic institutions and, and permanent re representatives of the UN and other um, international organizations in Geneva. And this um, dialogue really um, aims to help to advance the SDGs and also kind of to think already beyond um, the Agenda 2030. So this again goes hand in hand with the strong belief that science and diplomacy, they must work together to ensure that the, the, the breakthroughs benefit all. Um, and, and actually this points um, to something that I think it was you, Bart, uh, mentioned that um, why we need a new paradigm for international type policy, in fact, we see that um, this interaction between those communities, um, um, well, actually within the interaction within the diplomatic communities, we see that there's more and more um, awareness of the potential of science diplomacy. So there's really an appetite to see actually how can science diplomacy help to um, find answers to those very difficult questions of uh, multilateral governance. And um, the, the, um, the, the vision, the, the dream, um, our main objective is to really establish the OKI as, as a first truly multilateral effort to accelerate applications of quantum computing for the SDGs. And that means that um, we are empowering um, digital developers from target geographies to leverage quantum computing for challenges that are relevant to their- Oh own yeah, last career. minute. Mm -hmm. Um. So the last thing that I wanted to kind of share with you is um, a report um, that I encourage you to download. It was already mentioned by Mira. Um, it's um, uh, our intelligence report that was um, prepared in cooperation with 21 countries um, in Geneva, um, represented in Geneva um, on various topics, various themes um, that we feel that they felt and, and we, feel, we felt we need to take a deeper dive into relevant to uh, quantum computing. That included um, the, the question of how to mitigate the risk of um, a new digital divide. Um, there was a lot um, um, around human agency, um, exploring real world impact. And this is goes again towards um, the question of um, which SDG applications um, um, we could um, focus on. Um, security, um, while um, cryptography is not one of our um, core priorities, um, we work with um, experts from industry and government and academia to kind of ensure that um, the activities of the OKI are deployed safely. Um, and then um, obviously, standardization and also environmental impact are also um, themes that that um, we have been looking into. Um, there is now um, discussions to um, um, have a second um, edition of, of, of that intelligence report. And we are very thankful that um, uh, we have a quite an active diplomatic community contributing um, um, to, um, yeah, the, the work that led um, to that intelligence report. Um, last but not least, um, just going quickly through, um, we as already have mentioned, um, we have entered the pilot phase now um, at CERN. Um, we are, this means we are in operational mode, um, uh, kicked off a few weeks ago. 
And um, as now OKI is hosted at CERN, we continue um, to be a forum for science diplomacy um, and we encourage everyone in the room um, who is not yet um, a partner or a member to consider becoming one as um, we believe that um, we um, the, the, the time is here for um, a neutral um, honest broker between the different communities and also um, um, yeah, having a forum where we find a new common language, as you can all tell that um, um, bringing all these different communities together means that we actually need to um, first um, start to understand each other. So this is happening right now. And um, um, having said this, thank you for having had the opportunity to introduce um, our work to you. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions either now or later in follow-up conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there, we have two questions. Uh, and one online. So we're, uh, we're done. So, uh, Doc, uh, first. It's a comment. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, if you can come a little bit closer with the camera, then the, the sound. I'm bringing you. We meet in the middle, like always. Oh, yeah. I can see That's, you and hear you now. <laughs> so, so it's a comment. I was, I was on that picture. I was there at the launch as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, it's more of a comment on the session. So we have, sorry, the, um, you know, the OECD, just uh, the World Economic Forum, um, we all are particular spaces producing particular things. I don't think we compete. I think we can work very well together. The OECD, very slowly, we have committees and policy makers, but we need things that the World Economic Forum that moves fast and quick. Sometimes it may be too quick, and to just and to share some of these things. So, for example, I, I do know in synthetic biology we've invited WEF to come to us, and we've invited Jesda to come to the OECD to bring their expertise. I just wanted to comment on that because it's about who's producing the information, what type of information, and what are the nature of these fora. So, it's just a comment because Jesda plays a very particular role, and so does WEF, and so does the OECD. But very nice to see, well, how do these all interlink in interesting ways? Just a comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you hit it, um, you hit the point. So, um, you know, the the idea um, of, of being an honest broker or being that neutral platform uh, implies that um, we have um, all voices represented. Um, we feel that, uh, Majesta, that there is a void that needs to be filled to really um, have underrepresented uh, geographies um, in, in, in our focus so that we don't have the, the usual suspects um, in the room. Um, you all know who the front and powerhouses are. And of course, um, they have an interest to be part of the conversation. But I think there's really like an opportunity that we combine forces and our efforts to um, have more um, focused dialogues with um, regions, um, geographies, that um, have not been part of the discussion and um, who have lacked um, until now opportunities to um, participate in in um, our conversations and our conversations as a as an international um, quantum community. So um, we we are very um, um, keen to continue collaborations with OECD and and also um, our exchange with with WEF. Um, and we do see that 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 our unique um, uh, role to play is to um, shift the cursor towards um, applications um, that accelerate the achievements of the SDGs and, and also see how we can go beyond um, the agenda. Okay, thank you. There's, a, there's one more question which is online, but it will be read to you. Um, yes, I can, I can shout. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So KI takes into account dual use concerns given its strong ties to the diplomacy and security communities, or does it try to be the alternative to the quantum arms race discourse? You can read it on the on the Zoom chat as well. So yes, yes, I just read it. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I need to smile because this question always comes when we give presentations that talk about OKI. Okay, um, yes, we do uh, take dual um, use concerns into account. It's um, part of um, the discussions we have um, within our diplomatic community. 
um, just for, for your understanding, we meet the diplomatic community on a regular basis. We have different fora created for them. And it's something that absolutely um, is at the top of our discussions. We um, just want to make sure that we are not um, falling into the trap of focusing um, only on, on applications that, that are happening within the military um, and, and defense space, but really am helping to kind of encourage and, and, and support the development of use cases that focuses um, on the other spectrum of, of, of applications. Okay, thank you. And thank you for uh, your last minute uh, stepping in, uh, replacing Tim Smith. Uh, I hope he's well, uh, but thanks for giving this talk. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you. We're moving, uh, we're staying um, um, online. Uh, and our last speaker of this panel is Joost van Boca, the legal lead in Open Delta and uh, University of Amsterdam. Uh, please take uh, the screen, so to say, all right. Yes, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm already in your break time, I think, so I'll try to keep it relatively uh, short. Can you, you can hear me well and see, do you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, like uh, like Peter said, I'm uh, Peter and I are collaborating. Also, Claire, who's I think in the room, I heard her voice. Uh, we're uh, we're all part of uh, Quantum Delta NL's Action Line Four on ethical, legal, and societal aspects of quantum technologies. I'm based at the University of Amsterdam, where, with the support of uh, Quantum Delta NL, I'm leading now a research group on the law and governance of quantum technologies. So what I'm going to do is actually give you a little bit of insight into the into the composition on the group and the approach of the group and the topics that we're uh, that we're addressing. I think in about uh, half a year, year's time, there's going to be a lot more like kind of research results also coming out of the group. At this point, uh, I think this would be the most interesting for you to uh, to hear about. And I end with a few points uh, for for uh, discussion. It's um, it's great uh, to have the invite to contribute, and I'm very very sorry not able to be there uh, in person uh, with you. I would have loved to uh, to connect and also reconnect with uh, with people I know uh, in the room. So on the research group, so I I, um, I mean I think you know in the end I've been I've been myself in this space of quantum technologies now for a few uh, years already. I um, I got involved in uh, in a relatively large consortium in the Netherlands called uh, uh, Quantum Software Consortium that was uh, was set up with uh, with, the, with the Dutch uh, Science Foundation grant, uh, the biggest grant that you can get in the Netherlands, with like a kind of an interdisciplinary setup, interdisciplinary in the sense of mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, physicists, like engineers. And, uh, but also a little part of the project was called the Legal and Societal Sounding Board, and I uh, was involved in that, and we did some research in that context. And then over time, I got involved also in Quantum Delta NL, and now for some years I've been doing that. But in the end, I mean, in the end, with doing research, there's always that question, like how do you ask, how to ask the right questions, what are the right questions to really ask, you know, and, and also to ask questions that, that really... You know, allow for like a deep, deeper dive into uh, some of the issues that are uh, relevant in a in a quantum uh, space. So what uh, what we did uh, with the group and what I did in the group is like generally speaking, we approach questions of like legal dimensions of uh, law and governance of quantum technologies. We approach quantum technologies through a lens of law and digital infrastructure. So the uh, the assumption there there is that we have, of course, like uniquely powerful and very pervasive digital infrastructure impacting like all spheres of activity, societal, economic, political, defense activity in the world. You know, like so. And I think the promise of quantum technologies is to a large extent that um, in different ways, quantum technologies are going to create further improvements and empowerments of that digital infrastructure. Either, you know, by offering new forms of niche computing, 
like different kind of um, uh, even like creates communications with, with different properties or add some properties to particular kinds of communication and also add more power to sensing capabilities. So that's the that's the starting point. You know, then I think, I mean, of course, we are in a legal field, but we're combining a few like sub disciplines in law. We are grounded in information law, law and technology and international law. So it's like a collaborative setup, uh, the research group also within the within the legal research space. We are trying to understand the broader landscape or maybe landscapes, because depending also the technology and the question, the landscapes uh, may be different before really also zooming in on the quantum uh, landscape. Often we do find ways to see quantum also as a case study, as a particular like of a more broader kind of phenomenon. We are uh, trying to connect the future uh, to the past and also uh, be grounded in the present and centering uh, also the path dependencies of emerging uh, technologies. And uh, finally, we are quite interested in general kind of divides and dynamics between public and private, global north and global south, between states, companies and uh, citizens. In terms of the thematic constitution of the group, we have um, a strong emphasis on questions of access to the technology, but in particular also questions of access to computing, access to quantum computing. We've heard like just the previous speaker, of course, talk about a whole project in that space. It's one of the governance topics in the area of computing that is, of course, one of the most uh, interesting considering some of the foreseen applications as well. We have work on advanced sensing and the governance of quantum data this is related to quantum sensing space. We are looking at the role of law in shaping innovation in quantum technologies. So this is not a question so much as like how should law react to eventual technology and applications, but it's also really looking at what the role of law is um, in shaping the quantum technology ecosystem. You know, like so and there in particular, you can think about on the one hand, you know, like intellectual property uh, dynamics, how are particular intellectual property frameworks called upon and how are they actually functioning? Are they functioning well in this uh, in this space? And also, uh, of course, uh, more knowledge security, security, dual use dynamics, in particular, also export controls. Then standardization efforts in uh, in the area of quantum technologies which have uh, been kicked off in various fora. And finally, uh, digital sovereignty, uh, which is in Europe, of course, has become really quite an important topic. It's like a topic with a longer lineage, but in Europe over the last years, we have this strong emphasis on strategic autonomy, digital sovereignty, and information security. Information security in particular also connected to responses to the emergence of quantum technologies, in particular also the post-quantum cryptography transition. So just uh, this is me. I already said something about myself. Um, second researcher involved is Ot van Dale, who is an assistant professor. He finished the PhD with a, with a good chunk of the work relating to what, what from a human rights perspective, if you follow human rights, like the human rights framework and the principles, that underpin the human rights framework. What does it mean for like government obligations in relation to the innovation in quantum computing and their response to it? You know, in particular, looking also at the challenges to information security that would arise from uh, very well functioning quantum computers that we don't have yet, but they'll maybe come in the future. So then we have three PhD researchers involved. Um, some of them were actually two, the two uh, at the top were actually at the launch of JESTA. Some of you may have met them uh, there, Anushka Mittal and An uh, Bing. Anushka is looking into the broader dimensions of governance of access to computing and quantum computing. And An is looking at this question of how law is shaping innovation in quantum technologies. And um, then there's Bengi Zebek, who is investigating quantum sensing and measurement technologies and the role of those technologies in shaping the relationship between law and digital infrastructure. We have two, uh, three actually uh, postdoctoral researchers. Uh, Petros Terzis is looking at the standardization space. Plixavra um, Foyatzolu 
is uh, looking at digital sovereignty. And uh, finally, Laima Janschute, she is looking at the governance of post-quantum cryptography and the transition to those technologies. We have two more senior um, uh, international law scholars also involved, Andrea Leiter, who is uh, particularly, in, she's in the area of international law and technology, and she's focusing on global inequality and transnational lawmaking and the role of private actors in the digital economy. And then finally, Jeff Gordon, who's been a like enthusiast in relation to quantum, did already some work on quantum technologies and international law for quite a while. And so he's written about issues of digital sovereignty and also contemporary infrastructures um, and transformations uh, to international law in relation and relations, international law and international relations in light of quantum technologies and also quantum theory, which is an interest. Okay, so that's just a little overview of the group. As you see, it's quite a it's quite a sizable group. Of course, it takes a little bit, little bit for everybody to get started off, and there is a bunch of empirical work that is also going to happen. So this is really, you know, hopefully, especially going to pay off in the coming years. For discussion, I just want to, you know, like give a few thoughts. I think. It is really important. What's that? It was one minute uh, left. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done after this. Yeah. So I think it's very important to acknowledge the role of hype in our discussions, in our conversations. You know, like there's uh, a conversation we've also been ha having about like, can there be healthy forms of hype and like unhealthy forms of hype? But it's like the fact that there is quite a bit of hype uh, around is something that needs to be, I think, quite uh, explicitly acknowledged uh, all the time. So then finally, I, I, uh, secondly, I think we should be realistic about quantum as a solution for big problems. I have personally become a little bit allergic to this kind of big projections of new technology solving all the world's problems. I think a lot of ways, like we have to really find ways to solve the, big, uh, the world's problems. But like, like looking at something as quantum technology to do the job for us, I don't think it's convincing. And it feels to me a little bit like hoping that like some aliens are going to come from some other planet to save humanity from itself. I think really we, we need to be realistic about this. Of course, we can work on technology benefiting towards like dealing with certain issues and not making things worse. But even that is already quite a challenge. Understanding the international technology governance ecosystem, I think, is, of course, very important. We have very particular and like high politic, high geopolitic dimensions to, um, you know, what is happening also in the quantum space and understanding what is happening there. It's quite important to understand how, you know, this technology can in the end benefit uh, our societies. We should look at the real world applications in our discussions. But I think if we want to understand the law and governance kind of dimensions and the governance of technology, quantum technology, we also have to acknowledge that there's quite a lot of symbolic payoffs, you know, like to be the first, you know, as a country, you know, like just like the kinds of, you know, politics that geopolitics that are playing out, you know, between particular countries. And, um, you know, like so some of those things are just much more symbolic and it's like mark it's not that easy to really give evidence for you know like or they're not like people are not even looking for evidence that the technology is really going to really do something you know but th that creates a, another dimension to uh the puzzle of how to govern these, these new technologies and the production and innovation in these technologies and then finally, and that's really like the big one I think from an international law and governance perspective how to balance the security interests on the one hand and like to keep innovation in these technologies and also scientific collaboration as open uh, as possible. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, just the picture here of the research group and there's a picture of our action line for ecosystem from the last program day uh, that we did in, the, in December. And uh, be happy to be in touch with any of you and also happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Two questions. Um, other questions? Uh, 
Hi, Yoris. Um, remember, we had some nice drinks together in December and a good chat. And we were stuck on a corner of a French speaking table, so forced into an interact. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I have a question about your hype, the hype thing. I mean, hype is necessary for mobilizing resources. And uh, the hypnotists, the ones who are using <laughs> hype to convince people um, as a way of hypnosis around a, the, the topic, you can't escape it. So are, are you saying that we somehow have to have a metric, a scale of hyping, so that we don't overhype um, <laughs> when we're forced to hype to, to defend ourselves? So we're in a regime of hyping for funding. We can't help it. So it's very, I, I, I'm really stuck with this question of how to manage hype. Um, Claire and I were talking about this positive hype. What could that be? And a negative hype. What could that be? We need some kind of measure so what would be your measure of right and wrong <laughs> no that's I, I i mean this is a bigger this is a bigger debate it's a bigger question it's also not it's not necessarily kind of my direct field you know like it's like i think partly this is a question also of science uh, communication and partly it's a question of ethics of any kind of profession dealing with new technology you know like so as an artist or like as a journalist or as a policymaker or as an academic, you know, you will have a different kind of ethical standard of like how to, uh, you know, wh whether hype and what kind of hype is appropriate. So that's like, that would be my first answer. It really depends quite a lot on the context. So the context that I uh, move around in like mostly is on the one hand, it's a scientific uh, context an academic context. And there I want to work with, you know, real empirical observations. And so hype is something to take into account and to work with. Like it's a reality. It's like, a, it's a, it's a, so that's like sociologically, this is happening. It matters in the world that there is hype. You can look at the impacts, you know, there's questions about the normative, normative kind of evaluation of the hype. But that again, that is then something that would be quite contextual. In the other space that I'm uh, moving in quite a bit is more like the policy space. You know, like, so there, I think it's important also to acknowledge the way in which hype can be, you know, created also in ways that like really to shape regulatory agendas, you know, like, and to frame the issues in very particular ways, you know, like, let's say, like to make the regulatory discussion about AI instead of maybe some underlying kind of infrastructures that like are producing like a lot of these technologies enabling these technologies. So there, there are ways in which like the framing and the hype around the particular technology can impact the regulatory agenda and the types of choices that are mean, being made in our, you know, by our politicians, our democratic institutions around how to, you know, like to, to balance interest in our society. So. That is a place where I think also looking at hype is very important, but also in very particular ways. But it's a big discussion. We're organizing actually a workshop or like one of my colleagues in uh, and Peter's colleagues in um, is, is, is pulling uh, that together. Julia Kramer will have a, a whole week long. I, I think that we'll discuss hype and, and hopefully have some uh, conclusions from that. We we try to invite Doc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, f final question. Uh, Sir, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. I was just wondering about your last point. You were um, in the discussion part about the security and open innovation and how to um, how to bring them together. And I was wondering um, if you could describe a little bit more um, in which way this can be achieved, like open innovation, like bringing many stakeholders together um, and perceive in the innovation process, but on the other side, um, like how to have this, or what kind of security is necessary in this respect and how is this ensured? Yeah. Okay, big question. Uh, yeah, it's a very big question. Maybe I would like, maybe I would first say a little bit also connecting it also a little bit to the previous and some discussions that I've been having also recently with, with other experts in this uh, space. So, I mean, one of the things that you see in the area of like where the area of law where there's a lot of the securitization is coming from. So let's say export controls in particular is that 
there's on the one hand, there's a lot of kind of, there's just the high level geopolitics of that, you know, like so, and there are particular kind of political reasons why export controls are being imposed on these new technologies that have not really been fully developed yet. You know, like, so like now you maybe see France and Spain like adopting export controls rules with respect to quantum computing technologies that are like far from being realized, you know, like so. And um, and of course those, and there's the geopolitics of that, but then understanding how those export controls actually function in practice, there's hardly any proper information about it. It is very, very, very hard to really understand um, whether those export controls have any kind of uh, positive or like meant uh, like uh, uh, impacts, you know, like so as a first instance, what also needs to happen is we, we need to un actually understand what is going on, understand some of the reasons why things are going on in the way that they're going on and understand their impacts. Because at the moment, we are just kind of having these more high level uh, discussions. But I think because of the more symbolic payoffs of the quantum technologies and the techno nationalist like kind of dynamics that we also see that were referred to, I think also by uh, by Bart uh, earlier, there's a there's a risk that it's really the symbolism that matters, you know, like so. And from the area of other kind of information security issues, we know there can be a lot of security theater, you know. But if this is all theater and it has real world impacts in terms of like like making it less possible to collaborate and innovate across borders. And then actually the payoffs are just, you know, symbolic and like you're not really getting anywhere with those kind of measures, but they have a real impact, then that's something that is not going well. And I think some of that may be happening in the quantum space. And so that is something that uh, that we're interesting to uh, to understand better. But the overall kind of balance between security and innovation is one that uh, that is indeed, like Peter also said, that's a gigantic question. We can only hope to contribute to that, uh, I think, a little bit. And we also have to be quite realistic about what is possible in that space, you know, because uh, rhetorically we can get very far, but the real world politics are there, you know, like and the dynamics be between the U.S. and China are there. We cannot, uh, we cannot just undo those kinds of uh, geopolitics that exist in the world. But it's a great question. Thanks. With that, uh, yeah, we can't take the name. With that, I want to end this uh, session. Thanks a lot, uh, Joris. Uh...